round of applause. Yeah. Um, so it's my pleasure today to introduce Jason Moore. Uh, my name is Gabriel Rocha. I'm an assistant professor of history here at Drexel. Uh, before I hand it over to our illustrious guest speaker, I just want to thank a few of the individuals and entities that, that made today's event possible. At the top of that list, uh, I want to thank Irene Cho and Sharon Greenwich, uh, without whom we would probably be standing outside in the <laughs> rain or in the sprinkling and just staring off in the distance. So thank you, Sharon and Irene, um, for your stealthy behind-the-scene labors. I also want to thank colleagues who helped spread the word about the event uh, from both at Drexel and beyond, um, and, uh, and also my, my colleagues in the history department, um, especially Debjani Bhattacharya and Alden Young, uh, who collaborated with me in obtaining a grant to make today uh, possible, uh, as well as other environmental history events throughout this year. Um, and, of course, Scott Knowles for encouraging and supporting us in that process. And that brings me to express gratitude uh, to the sponsors of the event, uh, the Office of Faculty Affairs, the College of Arts and Sciences, and the Department of History at Drexel. Um, and then, of course, there's, there's Jason to thank. So thanks for being here. Um, as many of you know, Jason is an environmental historian and historical geographer coming to us from Br Binghamton University, where he is a professor of sociology. Now, you'll notice that in that one sentence, I just blew by three disciplines bridging the humanities and social sciences. And if that weren't enough, uh, much of uh, Jason's scholarly efforts, um, as you know, one of the leading proponents of the world ecology framework of analysis, uh, is geared towards dismantling some further divides between the social and natural sciences. I think it's a testament to his trailblazing scholarship that so many people from all sorts of disciplinary backgrounds have gathered today in this room. Um, so I'll just you know, say quickly, uh, he's a prolific author. Um, he's, he's won many uh, books, book prizes and essay prizes. Um, and uh, you know, most recently, uh, some of his, his books include uh, Capitalism in the Web of Life, Ecology and the Accumulation of Capital, out from Verso in 2015, as well as Anthropocene or Capitalocene, Nature History and the Crisis of Capitalism, from PM Press in 2016. And then most recently, um, with, uh, co-authored with Raj Patel, A History of the World and Seven Cheap Things, A Guide to Capitalism, Nature, and the Future of the Planet, out from UC Press in 2017. Uh, and you know, I want to I want to give uh, you know as much time for us to hear uh, from Jason. Uh, I'll just say in closing that as a historian, and given that we've just recognized some of our exceptional history students, I would be remiss if I didn't note that in the midst of uh, the the remarkable transdisciplinary breadth of Jason's scholarship, there's a deep historical sensibility animating much of of his work, including you know uh, most most visibly a commitment to situating capitalism as a temporal process with a beginning, a middle, and perhaps an end. Uh, so the talk today uh, we'll hear is uh, entitled, oops, I think I accidentally just started the talk. Was that it? Um, the talk today we'll hear uh, is titled Dawn of the Capitalist Scene, Power, Nature, and Capital in the Early Atlantic, 1452 to 1793. Um, we'll hear from Jason, then we'll have some time for some, some questions and, and discussions. There are some refreshments in the back. Hello to everybody watching on live stream. Um, thank you all for being here, and join me in welcoming Jason Moore. All right, what a pleasure it is. Thank you so much, Daniel, for that kind introduction, and it's great to see so many people here, uh, especially uh, 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 new faces and uh, some familiar faces. So. Always great to come back. Of course, that means that I have to actually have something new to say, uh, I hope. Um, so the better known you get, you know, the standard keeps raising. Uh, so here's the big question. How do we want to think about, to think through, to act upon the great questions of crisis and justice, of power and production in an age of rapid climate change? So today, as we know, we confront a clear and present danger to life as we have known it for the past 12,000 years that geological era known as the Holocene. And as such eras go, the Holocene has been unusually stable. Indeed, the, those words are precisely what climate historians and scientists looking at this period often say, an era of unusual climate stability, 
of course, not so much these days. So how do we think about that? And how do we begin to develop the imaginaries to move forward? Well, we need a historical imagination appropriate to the times. So today's climate shift dwarfs previous moments of climate change in the Holocene. It's part of what Earth system scientists call a state shift, an abrupt, irreversible, and fundamental shift in the conditions of the web of life. To come to terms with the state shift in the biosphere requires also a state shift in how we think and act with other humans in the web of life. It requires, in other words, an intellectual state shift. And that requires coming to terms with the fantasy of the modern world. That is, that we exist in a cosmology of nature, of ecologies without humans, and of society, humans without ecology. Amongst the dangerous qualities of this human nature binary is the tendency to overestimate capitalism's resilience. Capitalism, allegedly a powerful social force outside the web of life, often, even, and especially for radicals, is endowed with a supernatural power. It is the alchemist's illusion made real. Capital in the 21st century, we are told, has been endowed with the capacity to spin profits out of climate disaster. And if some capitalists will surely cash in on disaster and genocide, there's little doubt that climate change is bad for the system as a whole. For climate change marks an implosion of the cheap nature model, a model of going out into the world and mobilizing, seizing, and taking for free or very low cost all the goodies of life, including human life, that has governed this cheap nature model, this frontier model, that has governed modern life and power and accumulation and rationality for five centuries. We're going to talk some over the next hour about this. Not least, but certainly not only, climate change promises a dramatic, abrupt, and irreversible shift from the web of life as a set of frontiers of cheap food, energy, labor, and raw materials to the web of life as a fundamental barrier to capital accumulation, a barrier at once inside, outside, and in between. This society-nature binary, so common to our thinking about the web of life, reproduces an enduring analytical problem with significant political implications. That's a problem that forces upon us a Hobson's choice between environmental determinism and social reductionism. The very meta-categories of contemporary environmentalist discourse, the Anthropocene, the Anthropos, and the adjective anthropogenic reinforce it. Of course, climate change is not anthropogenic. It is not made by all of us together. It is made by capital. It is capitalogenic. So we are forced in the either-or scheme of Cartesian dualism and society-nature thinking, we are forced to choose between the end of capitalism and the end of planetary life. We are encouraged to imagine the end of life more easily than the end of capitalism. But that is a mistake. For some version of both positions is unquestionably true. First, the conditions of planetary life as we have known it are indeed changing rapidly and irreversibly. Second, the organization of global power, capital, and nature, what I have called a capitalist world ecology, is now unraveling. If the Anthropocene as geological formation has just begun with its ugly stratigraphic markers of nukes, chicken bones, and plastics, capitalism as a geohistorical formation, that is, capitalism as an ecology of power, capital, and nature, is on its way out. So we need to begin to look at the conventional uh, uh, imaginaries and representations of crisis. Note the powerful neo-Malthusianism in here. Let's note the Malthus neo-Malthusianism is always about taking the big questions of the web of life outside of history. We have a powerful imaginary that stymies how we think of crisis. And uh, of course, the Anthropocene gives us answers to all of this. I want to try to get us outside of the Anthropocene box and the, uh, the fanciful notion that it, planetary crisis, or it, the end of life as we know it, or it, whatever it is, all began with the steam engine and coal and some Englishmen in the 18th and 19th century. So let's try to step out of that box and then and also try to rethink our imaginaries. So it's three big questions, but of course I wrote four uh, questions up here because I couldn't resist. So who and what caused this planetary crisis today, this station? When and where did this begin? How did we get here? And who, in any case, is we? So how we answer these questions is going to fundamentally shape our 
politics. And indeed, imaginaries like this will fundamentally limit the kinds of historical thinking, the kinds of historical narratives and, and investigations that uh, we tell. So these are the hockey stick images. What's the, the data they combine is much less important than the imaginary they present, which is an imaginary that it all started, you know, 50, 100, maybe 200 years ago. Uh, we're gonna challenge that. Here is the model of the great acceleration. So if you wanna understand capitalism's crisis, uh, uh, Earth system analysts and other mainstream analysts will give you a uh, one version of it. Marxists will give you another, but it's essentially the same argument. A crisis of society a cri plus a crisis in nature gives us some kind of planetary crisis. So what we have in, in, in looking at the Anthropocene discussions are, in fact, two major uh, uh, variants. One is the geological Anthropocene. Here's the debate over the periodization of the present geological era and whether or not it marks the end or a new stage of the Holocene based on research around what are the appropriate stratigraphic signals, hence atomic age testing, uh, uh, chicken bones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What are the stratigraphic signals? The other, so that Anthropocene is fine, and we can go back to it in Q&A, but that's not the one I'm really going to pick on. What I'm go really going to pick on is a resurgence of the popular Anthropocene. Here is a debate over the relations that initiated the drive towards planetary crisis, our present state shift, and how we go about understanding uh, the history and the historical geography of this process. Now, what I've argued, and I've already hinted at this here, is that the problem is not anthropogenic uh, biospheric change. It is not we are all in this together. It is not the Anthropocene. If we want to understand the relations of power, of rationality, of production and reproduction, of colonialized, racialized, and gendered violence that have made the world, it's not the Anthropocene. It's the Capitalocene. It's the age of capital. So the Capitalocene challenges this popular Anthropocene as a discourse. It says, wait a minute, maybe it didn't all begin with coal and a steam engine in England right around 1800. So these kinds of imaginaries give us a, a, a vision and a narrative of history in which the Anthropos drives these. And the problem with that is that the Anthropos of humanity in general is that humanity is not an actor. Capitalogenic refers not merely to the, uh, to the actions of particular capitalist entities of uh, uh, shareholders, of uh, bondholders, of financial speculators, of bankers, of merchants, etc., but also for a series of, of territorial, imperial, and state agencies that, that are implicated and wrapped up in co-producing a world committed to the endless accumulation of capital. So capitalogenic is important if we say, sorry, we're getting ahead there. So capitalogenic and saying it, it says more than economics determines everything. Indeed, the argument for the capitalocene is precisely an argument aligned against the kind of economic determinism and reductionism favored by mainstream as well as Marxist um, analysts of the uh, planetary crisis today. It asks, how do we join the accumulation of capital, this peculiar logic of endless economic growth, with the pursuit of power, with the co-production of nature as an organic and evolving whole, in other words, as a world ecology. Now, the popular Anthropocene's history of the origins of crisis and also the origins of modernity begins in England right around 1800. It says, you know, that the fundamental innovation, the breakthrough is Watt's rotary steam engine, uh, often periodized from 1784, which is why 1784 is not in the title of this talk, and uh, says that the, the massive sort of industrialization and, and machinification of the world occurs uh, um, in the uh, centuries after this epical moment. Now, that's problematic for a lot of reasons that I'm going to walk through over the next uh, uh, little bit. But if our concern is the origin of the modern relations of capital, nature, and power, and the origins of the relations that gave rise have given rise to planetary crisis today, then we need a different kind of periodization. And that's important to keep in mind. It's not saying the Industrial Revolution is unimportant. It is indeed a turning point uh, within the modern world, but it is not year zero of climate crisis. So we have to begin when, well, in 1492. 1492, not over. 
1492 is still going on. Not, it's not about getting in the way back machine. We have to take seriously the Colombian project. This is something that Raj Patel and I go through in some detail in our new book on seven cheap things. And maybe even not 1492, but 1452. What happens there? And uh, then in 1452, Prince Henry, the navigator, who turns out to not have been such a navigator, but that's a different question, uh, 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 gives uh, um, the first uh, 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 royal license to a planter on the island of Madeira, which is about 560 kilometers off the uh, uh, west coast of uh, Africa, to start the first... Uh, uh, modern sugar plantation. And what we see in Madeira in the next 60 to 70 years is something fundamental to all of our lives today, the long history of how industrial agriculture and racism in the form of slavery, but of course continuing into today's planetary apartheid, climate apartheid regime, and of how credit and money and, and the web of life were all wrapped up with each other. So there's a huge amount of history that goes into this uh, uh, a huge amount of very intimate and relevant history to our times. What would happen eventually was the formation of a sugar slavery nexus that, of course, continues to shape our lives today, not just in terms of industrial agriculture, not just in terms of uh, global racism and the global color line, um, but also in terms of the relations that drive planetary uh, warming and climate crisis today that, uh, um, as, as we know from recent IPCC reports, if you take forestry and uh, cash crop agriculture together, you have uh, one of the largest contributors to greenhouse gases in the world economy. So what we have here is uh, the emergence of a process that is not just about production, but is also about racism, is also about coerced labor, none of which, alas, has gone away. It is also not just about machinery. It is about what Max Weber famously calls the European rationality of world domination. I never learned that Max Weber when I took social theory uh, courses. Um, turns out Max was, Max was okay sometimes. Um, so, Max, so Weber uh, reminds us that, it's, that, that, that uh, capitalism is not just about machinery and markets and brute force, but is also about the emergence of what he calls the European rationality of world domination. This is a picture of an account book, a double entry account book uh, from the 17th century, but it's worth noting that the first uh, printed uh, uh, text on double entry uh, bookkeeping appears in 1494 and is tightly linked to the financing of the, uh, uh, of, of the invasions of the new world and indeed uh, uh, Double entry bookkeeping is used by the Spanish colonial state in Peru by the late 16th century. So there's, there's uh, uh, the dimensions of what uh, Lewis Mumford calls technics, that is the, the uh, combination of rationality and force and uh, 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 scientific procedures. This is uh, a map of the, this is from 1502. This is the Cantino Planisphere, which is one of the earliest surviving maps um, from uh, early modern maps from the Portuguese archives. The, uh, this is a fundamental machinery, if you will, a fundamental technology of world domination. Uh, this is from 1502. The next year, uh, the Portuguese would launch their invasion of the Indian Ocean and seize control of the key choke points in the Indian Ocean spice trading network. So this is no small thing. It is telling that we see this as epiphenomenal to planetary crisis today, but the steam engine as the key machine, and perhaps that priority should be inverted. So while we're talking about inversions, we need to invert both great traditions in thinking about capitalism and crisis and nature. And one of them is the environmentalist problematic which basically is asked, well, what does capitalism do to nature or industrial civilization or fill in the blank? And so its focus has very much been on degrading nature and what modernity does to degrade nature and how nature can be saved. That's often the, 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 the language of environmentalist thought. What I want to ask is what happens if we turn that inside out? What happens if we begin to ask how does capitalism put nature to work? We're going to return to this. So if we take the question of work and how does capitalism mobilize not just humans, 
but all life, how do we, uh, uh, to work for endless economic growth, for endless capital accumulation, what happens to our thinking? Now, we're going to pause there and we're going to come back to this question of work. The other thing that we need to turn inside out is not just, I'm not just going to pick on the environmentalists, but also the Marxists. So this has, the Marxist uh, uh, approach has often uh, had a uh, uh, difficult love affair with economic determinism. And this has come back in recent years around the climate crisis. So one of the things that I want to uh, uh, point out is that we have a kind of auto-accumulation model where Marxism says, well, capitalism is all about turning more and more things over to the market. Note the, the uh, uh, rather unfortunate uh, parallels with neoclassical thinking, where it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. All right, there we go. But we're not going to go there. We're, not, we're, gonna, we're gonna find a different way. We're going to look at how capital mobilizes work across the monetary, non-monetary divide. And we're going to pay special attention to how capital, uh, capitalism as a system of power and as a system of valuation organizes and recreates a tripartite division of labor uh, through the paid, paid work of human beings, the unpaid work of human natures, and the unpaid work of nature as a whole. This is a riff off of what Maria Mies, the great feminist uh, uh, um, social theorist, uh, an economic historian calls the appropriation of women, nature, and colonies. The reality of capitalism is not that it booms when it turns everything into something marketable, but, but rather when capital, capitalism booms when islands of commodification and monetization can draw on oceans of potential cheap nature. That is, cheap nature in the form of African slaves, of Persian Gulf oil in the 20th century, of English coal fields in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, of Baltic timber in the 17th century, American drain in the 1920s, in the 19th uh, and 20th century, Mississippi cotton, et cetera, et cetera. So the model works something like this. This is when capitalism booms, when uh, uh, small amounts of capital can, uh, uh, can work on large amounts of accumulated uh, unpaid work. Now the problem is that can't, capital can't do that very well by itself. It requires the state to do that. Now so far this is a very geometrical argument. It's not particularly historical or geographical. So let's see if we can get closer to a historical geographical explanation and begin by asking about the world historical significance of the Colombian invasion. Now the Colombian invasion was, of course, about plunder and violence of gold and silver, plus what the geographers Maslin and Lewis now call the Orbis Spike. But it was also more expansively about mobilizing the potential work energy of multiple continents. So here are some rather uh, typical uh, representations of this process that tend to miss some key elements. So this is important. We're going to keep this in our minds as we go through. But there's more to it than just the Colombian exchange, so old world plants and animals and diseases go into the new world. New world uh, um, plants and animals, but especially potatoes and maize flow into the old world. This is a bio, biogeographical unification of Pangaea, which of course had split apart 175 million years before. So this is really a biogeographical watershed in the history of planet Earth. And it occurred about two centuries into what climate historians call the Little Ice Age. The Little Ice Age began in the late 13th century, and what followed fit the usual pattern of transitions towards colder weather, 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 colder and wetter weather in the northern hemisphere. Try to say that ten times fast. The agroecological, the agroecological, the agricultural class and demographic regime of high feudalism by this point had begun to falter. When disastrous cold and wet weather hit in 1315, crops failed and a great famine ensued. You might be saying to yourself, well, it was feudalism, didn't crops fail all the time? Not so much. For centuries before, with considerable variation, there had been not only a dynamic agroecological regime, but very favorable weather from about the 9th century. The lords in this period, in the 14th century, were locked into a serial monocultural regime. So they wanted to produce 
uh, uh, grain above all, wheat and rye, to uh, satisfy their demand for cash money. So this was not a system in which you had uh, peasants working on the fields for free as part of their labor dues. This was a very commercialized, very dynamic system. The lords understood that a different agricultural system could feed people, but they weren't concerned about that. They were very locked into a particular economic objective, even as the climate turned decisively unfavorable. So insert your favorite parallels to the present moment, where we've been living through three decades plus of stagnating yield uh, growth in industrial agriculture. So by mid-century, by the middle of the 14th century, the Black Death, of course, arrived, spreading rapidly from Sicily in 1347 to England, pulsing through the arteries of transnational trade that feudal civilization had nourished. Western Europe's ruling classes sought to impose tight labor controls in the countrysides and the cities. So right away, the lords do what they do best, is say, well, let's uh, use force to reestablish the conditions of normalcy, to reestablish business as usual. But it didn't work. Most famously here pictured is the Grand Jacquerie from France in 1358. These have to be understood not merely as peasant and worker revolts that go on. These have to be understood as climate revolts. And uh, uh, that what we are seeing is, the, uh, is how climate and capital uh, and uh, uh, rather climate and class uh, interlace to produce uh, special situations of profound volatility. It's not important that you, uh, we're not going to tick off all of these, but simply to give you a taste of what was happening. So this is, of course, a very long and complex story, but two things are very clear. One is that feudalism as a civilization, as a world ecology, with a specific configuration of power and production in the web of life, did not survive. This would become very clear in two subsequent moments, first after 1450 and then after 1557. In this sense, feudalism experienced an epical crisis, a world historical crisis through which one mode of producing wealth, nature, and power gave way to another. The other thing is that we see the strong relation between climate history and civilizational history experienced a profound rupture from this 14th century crisis into the long 16th century because what we had always seen, and we saw this in the collapse of Roman power in the West in the 4th uh, uh, and 5th and 6th centuries, we saw this in, in the case of feudalism, that always before profound climate shifts had signaled a, uh, um, a more or less fundamental tension in the business as usual for the civilizations in, uh, uh, in Western Europe. This would not be the case with the rise of capitalism. We see something very unusual and unexpected uh, uh, according to the historical geographical pattern. That is that the Little Ice Age not only remains but intensifies at crucial points, and this does not signal the breakdown of state uh, power. This does not signal the decommercialization of life. It does not signal the end of capitalism, but rather results in capitalism uh, reinventing itself and projecting its power outward and outward and outward. So what we're going to do here is we're going to have a quick look at, uh, this is, uh, believe it or not, 2,000 years of climate proxies for the northern uh, hemisphere. This is from John Brooks, a uh, very useful uh, book on climate history. And what's important is not this, this, uh, uh, this, this is just planet, this is just natural history. This is geological history, but we're going to put this together with a kind of civilizational history. That is to treat climate as a geohistorical formation and to treat uh, uh, climate as constitutive of transformations within uh, and across various civilizations. So it's not, I'm not going to walk you through all of these moments, but basically here's the punchline, that you have two kinds of crises. You have developmental crises, which are major crises within a given mode of, of organizing power and nature and all the rest. And then you have epical crises, which are transitions from one mode to another, from feudalism to capitalism, from, uh, from the Roman Empire in the West to uh, a peasant mode of production in Central and Western Europe. That you have... In each of these, the, here are the, the, what are called solar minima. So when uh, the amount of solar radiation, solar intensity, uh, solar energy reaching uh, planet Earth dips, then things start to happen. These are volcanic events, which are also hugely important and often sync up and 
eerily interesting ways in, in the past uh, 2,000 years. You have a series of developmental, see, developmental crises. Here's Rome's third century crisis. Here are the barbarian invasions, not just about barbarians anymore, but about climate too, moving in during the worst drought in Central Asia in the past 2,000 years. That's the end of Roman power here. Uh, here, uh, here you have various transformations of feudalism. Here's our 14th century crisis right here at the wolf minimum. Uh, and here, strangely enough, is our three minimum that uh, correspond not with the decommercialization and political breakdown of capitalism, but rather the opposite, with the amplification of these processes. So this is what I'm calling the climate forcing of early capitalism. This cannot be abstracted from our pictures of uh, and our narratives of the modern world. Climate is fundamental, not just as limit, but as also as, as determined as a kind of one crucial determinant amongst many. So in this reading, climate always makes history, but not, of course, in conditions of its own choosing. Climate is geohistory is always bundled with and within human relations of power production and reproduction. So whatever we call these civilizations, modes of production, whatever, we have to understand these webs of human relations as irreducibly socio-ecological, not merely adding up the social and the ecological, but seeing them as fundamentally interpenetrating and ontologically cons constituting each other in and through each other at every point. So we need to see civilizations as ecologies of power and production that are at every turn porous and permeable with and within the web of life. That means that new properties emerge. In a nature plus society model, new properties cannot emerge because you are just adding up. But if you understand that climate and class and various forms of agriculture, and for that matter, culture, all uh, fundamentally make each other in terms of the specific historical geography of a civilization of crisis and the ways in which civilizations can respond, then you have a very different picture. So here's the rupture. While the long 14th century looks like previous moments of civilizational crisis, of these great epical crises especially, the expansion of the long 16th century, the two centuries after 1450, does not. Part of the explanation of this rupture is the biogeographical unification of temperate and tropical ecologies after 1452 and 1492. What happens to our thinking about capitalism if we recognize this moment as a geological and a geographical watershed in the history of humanity. What happens to our stories of climate crisis and climate justice today? So the creation of this is not just about power, not just about rationality, but of course also about money. So this was financed by, above all, the Genoese, but of course by many other creditors whose capital grew by an order of magnitude between the 16th and 13th, or between the 13th and 16th centuries. There was a very keen sense that the New World was, above all, a world of potential wealth, of continents of seemingly unlimited natures that could be monetized. It was also, and this is not a small thing, an early moment of forming the real abstractions of the civilized and the savage, in which indigenous peoples existed in a state of nature and were not or not yet part of civilization or society. So Columbus himself embodied the vista of Genoese bankers and sugar traders for whom he had worked, channeling the spirit of what I've called cheap nature from the first moment he saw the new world. On the eighth day of his first voyage within the Caribbean in 1492, he found a cape that he named Cabo Hermoso. I can never tire my eyes in looking at such lovely vegetation, he wrote, so different from ours. I believe there are many herbs and many trees that are worth much in Europe for dyes and for medicines, but I do not know them, and this causes me great sorrow. So here we see Columbus from the outset as an assessor, somebody with a keen sense of cheapness and value and power, able to cast his eye on nature and instantly be frustrated he couldn't see dollar signs. And if you're, if you're ever curious, go to see his diary of the first voyage. He mentions gold, I think, 72 times in a, in a diary that's not much more than 80 or 90 pages. Uh, it's very, it's, he was completely obsessed with, with money. 
So before there could be such a thing as Cartesian dualism after Rene Descartes of thinking things and extended things, there had to be a Columbian dualism. Before Descartes, I think, therefore I am, there had to be Columbus's, I conquer, therefore I am. So this western edge of Pangaea, the western hemisphere, was, as we know, radically and rapidly depopulated. Of perhaps 61 million people in the Americas in 1492, just 6 million could be found by the early 17th century. So this gives us one kind of periodization to reflect upon. That is, between 1492 and 1610, the latter date marking Lewis and Maslin's Orbis Spike, the low point of CO2 atmospheric concentration in modern world history. That would reinforce our Maunder minimum, that one uh, uh, right in the middle where you can see the general crisis of the 17th century. The Orbis spike plus the solar minimum leads to another climate forcing, that is the outward um, expulsion, the outward drive of European power and profit to dominate the planet, to put planetary life to work. We're going to come back to that. So overlapping this periodization is another in human history, the worldwide land labor transformations of the early modern centuries. Beginning in the half century after 1450 with the Colombian invasion, the sugar slave system in Madeira, the maturing of Dutch agriculture, and, the centra and Central Europe's mining and metallurgical revolution, we see the beginning of an abrupt break with the environment-making patterns of medieval Europe. So we have this industrial, pre-industrial uh, binary in our heads. We have to get rid of that. It's completely useless. It doesn't, it's, that's not what's, uh, uh, that's not going to help us come to terms with planetary crisis. Let me, uh, so for one thing, capitalism is profoundly industrial from the very beginning. But let me just offer one contrast between medieval Europe and early modern Europe to give you a sense of just how profound the rupture was centuries before the steam engine comes online. Uh, over centuries, feudal Europe has de had deforested large expanses of Western and Central Europe. Uh, after 1450, however, comparable deforestation occurred in decades, not centuries. In medieval Picardy, in northeastern France, it took 200 years to clear 12,000 hectares of forest. Four centuries later, in northeastern Brazil, at the height of the sugar boom in the 1650s, 12,000 hectares of forest were cleared in one year. So that's a two order of magnitude difference. Uh, no need for a steam engine, thank you very much. So nor was Brazil exceptional in this at the same period as northeastern Brazil's forests were being cleared at breakneck uh, speed. Poland's Vistula Basin was cleared on a scale and at a speed between five and ten times greater than anything seen in medieval Europe. Indeed, these two moments were tightly coordinated. The sugar produced in northeastern Brazil and the silver of uh, Potosi, to which we will return in a few moments, was carried on ships built with Baltic timber. So what occurred in these so-called pre-industrial uh, uh, centuries, which weren't pre-industrial at all, uh, what we see is an environment-making revolution as epical, as significant as anything seen in human history since the dawn of agriculture. And that's important to keep in mind because this, this, this rupture in the scale, scope, and speed, this great leap forward, if you will, in environment-making, environmental uh, um, transformation that occurs after 1450 uh, is a, gives us a crucial set of clues to understanding that something fundamental was shifting. So what was that fundamental thing that was shifting? Well, obviously the answer is going to be big and complex and I can't cover it all here, but let me just put my finger on one moment of it. The creation of planetary space, of global space, both in the imaginary, so remember that we have not just global maps, we saw the map of the Cantino planisphere from 1502, but also globes themselves. The earliest surviving globe we have, in fact, dates from 1492, strange coincidences, I know, uh, that, that uh, to be able to conquer the globe, you had to imagine it. But in order to, uh, uh, but to do that, you could also begin to stand outside the global space and to imagine it as a set of resources to work cheaply for capital. What happens with the rise of capitalism was the emergence of a new valuation of reality and a new valuation of wealth that would unfold 
around a spectacular cosmological revolution. That is, nature over here, society over there. Now, the shift was one from land as the decisive metric of wealth so, to labor as the decisive metric of wealth. So if you were a medieval lord or a medieval cultivator, what you cared was how many bushels of rye you could get from a hectare of land. No longer with the rise of capitalism, it was how much rye or wheat could you get per average worker year. And that was something that was experienced and reproduced at multiple geographical scales. So we had the emergence of this, this new valuation of the world that involved, on the one hand, a fracturing of reality into an economic zone of profit and loss, of, count, of cost accounting rationality, double entry bookkeeping, and innovations that aim for cost minimization and output maximization. But that wasn't all. It wasn't just about the economic sphere. It also involved the creation, not merely of an intellectual zone, nature in the uppercase, but also nature as a new domain into which most humans of the 17th century, 16th and 17th centuries and later, were relocated. That is, the value of the work and lives of women, indigenous peoples, enslaved Africans, subordinated Irish and, uh, workers and others, was radically redefined and in various ways radically cheapened. So this means something that our two-century industrial revolution model of capitalism has been reluctant to acknowledge. The active creation of systems of gendered, racial, and colonial domination constituted epical levers for the advance of labor productivity, the production of surplus value across the early modern centuries. The rapid pace of landscape change after 1450, and especially after 1550, turned on putting landscapes and other so-called natures in the uppercase, enslaved and coerced Africans, indigenous peoples, women, Slavic peoples, to work for capital. The law of value in this light begins to look like a law of cheap nature. So that's still a conceptual argument. It's getting us closer to the historical geography of it all, but not yet there. And I think one crucial turning point has to begin with 1557, a year of financial crisis as fundamental to its time as 1929 was to its, its era, or 2008 was to the early 21st century. So if Bradell would call the next 70 years after 1557 the age of the Genoese, it also clearly marked a geohistorical shift that would install Amsterdam as the headquarters of a world ecological revolution that established the conditions for Euro-American industrialization three centuries later. In 1557, Philip II, King of Spain, rescheduled Castile's de debt, converting short-run obligations into long-run bonds through the mechanism of the euro, spelled with a J. So France followed suit in short order, declaring bankruptcy the same year. Portugal would do so in 1560. The bankruptcies, and these were not the only ones, precipitated a crisis in Antwerp's money market, and thence capitalism's first big international bank crash. It was a blow from which Antwerp would never recover. If Spain's sacking of Antwerp in 1576 sealed its fate, the fault lines had come to the surface decades earlier in 1557. That's significant because Antwerp had been the switchboard of commerce and finance between southern and northern Europe in the first 16th century, between 1450 and 1557. It was the place where Atlantic sugar and Central European copper and silver flowed through each other. Over the first half of the 17th century, however, you would see a profound shift. You would see uh, the rise of Amsterdam not merely as a commercial center, but as a financial sector and as a coordinating center for global production, uh, which would stretch from Southeast Asia to Brazil and everywhere in between. By 1639, the Amsterdam Bourse, the stock, the stock market, the world's first, modern world's first stock exchange, saw 360 different commodities listed. By 1685, there were 550 commodities. The, the, the Amsterdam Bourse and a growing network of merchant banks helped to make Amsterdam not only the center of world commerce, but the epicenter of global environmental restructuring. Ready cash would directly cheapen nature's wherever possible and make possible superior military force whenever necessary. So here we see not only power and capital, that's an old story told by historical sociologists and economic historians. We see not only power and capital, but we see a profoundly modern trinity 
capital, power, and world nature. So we have to become much smarter about thinking about money and finance as a way of organizing world nature. So this is also directly seen in the extraordinary historical geography of Potosi and colonial Peru uh, in the 1560s and 70s. So what Spain was doing in this era uh, under Philip II was essentially fighting an endless series of military campaigns. A debt valued at 30 million ducats in 1556 doubled to 60 million a decade later, 100 million by 1598. He declared bankruptcy two more times in just 20 years. And so there was this ongoing process of, of uh, military power, violence, war making that was intimately related to the colonial and imperial extraction of work in colonial Peru. So when Potosi's silver output stagnated in the 1560s, this was a fairly big deal. Yields on Potosi ores in the 1560s were just 2% of what they had been in the glory days of the 1540s in the initial plunder economy. And so what, what happened was that Philip uh, empowered a new viceroy, uh, to, uh, uh, Francisco de Toledo, to go and reorganize the life of this vast region. Uh, and it was... The story is quite extraordinary because what we saw was not only the, the uh, uh, construction of a massive hy hy uh, hydraulic infrastructure, something like 23 artificial lakes were constructed, but also the reorganization of one and a half million people in colonial Peru, the, of indigenous peoples, their reorganization into reductions, into what were called during Vietnam strategic hamlets, but were called at the time reductions. And uh, they, were all, they were all organized with um, uh, the idea that, that the production in uh, Potosi, the silver mines would uh, uh, continue to flow, would revive, and that is indeed what happened. Three million Andeans would work in the mines before uh, the labor draft the, called the Mita would be abolished in 1819, and that dramatically undercounts the number of people at work because these uh, workers would travel with their families. There was a huge amount of social reproductive labor that was central to the whole process. Indeed, what happened in this era was this interesting uh, process where silver production, which had collapsed, was revived through technological innovation, large-scale extractive industrial innovation, large-scale colonial biopolitical innovation to reconcentrate uh, uh, indigenous peoples into towns where they were required to send labor, et cetera, et cetera. And the result was not only continued demographic decline and crisis for the vast majority, but also the radical simplification of mountain environments. So that even as early as 1603, an, an anonymous observer wrote that uh, uh, there's no sign that this mountain near Potosi ever had a forest. And when uh, the, the Spaniards first came here, there was a great deal of hunting of small animals. These have all disappeared. And uh, that everything, uh, even the, the soils that were once there have been uh, uh, completely uh, eroded and uh, 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 we, can't, we can't even tell that there was ever soil on this mountainside. So it was, it was a site of profound human and environmental transformation in which the mix of these different processes gives us a very different story from how we usually think of these uh, uh, processes. Well, a big chunk of this silver, there's, a lot of, there's been a lot of great historical work on silver over the past a few decades, much of it centering on uh, the Acapulco galleons and the flow of American silver into East Asia. That's a very important story and uh, has been told often and well. Uh, what's uh, uh, been less attended to is that much of the silver, perhaps 15 to 20 percent of it, found its way into the Baltic. Now, the Baltic is, a, is the, you know, this uh, really falls off this uh, particular map. And that's unfortunate because it was in the Baltic that the uh, vastly expanding fleets of northern Europe, uh, uh, the, it was Baltic timber that made those possible, Baltic uh, uh, tar and pitch uh, uh, that made those vessels seaworthy. It was also Baltic timber uh, that was the uh, basic raw material for what's called potash, well, not mineral potash, but potash derived from trees, which was necessary to bleach fabrics. Uh, so there were all of these absolutely important and, and pivotal elements in this story that, that show how 
the colonial, environmental, labor, political, imperial uh, histories, the political economy of Northwestern Europe, and the political ecology of the Americas are all implicated in each other in this period. Now, now returning to this, what we see here, what these arrows are, are, are the movements of the center of the sugar frontier. This is Sao Tome here. This is Madeira right by here, Sao Tome here. It goes uh, to uh, uh, northeastern Brazil. It goes into the Caribbean. This, this is important for lots of reasons, one of which is that sugar was the fundamental mass commodity of early capitalism. The other is that it gives us a sense of just how dependent capitalism is on the frontier. And so we have, we have uh, um, a process that, that shows in its dynamism, its geographical restlessness, a, um, a set of... Uh, a set of properties that really, really illuminates how how powerful, how how environmentally transformative uh, this process was long before the industrial revolution. The what I would point out in in challenging this conventional well, here's the social history, here's the environmental history narrative, is that every time these were moving, you saw new slaving frontiers open in Africa. So the transformations of land and the transformations of labor uh, uh, are. Uh, intimately connected, and so we need to understand that that the, uh, uh, this uh, uh, these are uh, these regions of sub-Saharan Africa were uh, in a process of constant geographical revision. There were labor frontiers that were intimately related to uh, land commodity frontiers, as in sugar and vice versa. So that's that's crucial to keep in mind when we want to think about how the histories of work and life and power and, and environmental change are all implicated in each other. Now, one of the things that happens that is counterintuitive is that during the great crisis of the 17th century, so if we remember this, uh, uh, um, our uh, well-worn uh, climate graph, if we look at the second to last one of these, the Maunder Minimum, which was uh, one of the most severe moments of the Little Ice Age, we see a dramatic and ongoing expansion push, this climate forcing of capital and labor and uh, productive technology into the Caribbean, uh, um, into the Caribbean sugar frontier especially. So there is a, a moment through which the biogeography of capitalism allows for uh, uh, this weird logic, this weird system of endless um, uh, accumulation to uh, continue ramping up despite uh, rather unfavorable climate uh, conditions. We can see this uh, a bit more here. Yeah, here we go. This is this is a chart that uh, looks at uh, uh, capitalist GDP. This is so. This is Western European economic growth um, according to Angus Madison, whose figures are always suspect, but I haven't been able to find any better. Uh, with the annual slave departures uh, from Africa, uh, with the crisis of the 17th century. So, if we want to make this really crude. Uh, uh, climate was offset by what I've called the social death surplus profit. That is, bring more Africans out of Africa. Of course, Africans are not part of civilization. They're part of nature. And treat them accordingly. Put them to work in cash crop agriculture. This is, again, the climate forcing of the crisis of the 16th century with European colonialism. So the, one, of the, one of the elements of um, capitalist globalization from 1492 has been precisely uh, um, uh, uh, a change in climate. Indeed, the, here is a, a rather ungainly um, uh, uh, map, but this shows that in fact there's no economic there's there's no economic crisis in the metropolitan centers during the the 17th uh, century. This is per capita economic growth, which is telling because per capita uh, this is also a moment of profound demographic expansion. Indeed, the demographic revolution, the proletarian revolution of uh, the 17th and 18th centuries was the condition for the Industrial Revolution. So we have here a series of um, transformations in which the, just to return to our map, because I think it can help us visualize some things, that, that the transformations of Western Europe are, are uh, completely and irreducibly non-autonomous and are utterly and totally dependent on a series 
of colonial and neo-colonial regions from the Baltic to northeastern Brazil and the West Indies to fur trading frontiers to Southeast Asia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this forces us to rethink our sense of how the politics and economics and environmental history of the modern world and as it came to be uh, formed. Now, where does this leave us? Well, ultimately, it has to tell us something about what happened in the buildup to the Industrial Revolution. So what I want to do here in just closing this out is to make, I think, two or three big points. One is that this era of the rise of capitalism, this long 16th century, saw not only this intersection of climate and work and power and ecology, that was one part of it, but also the emergence of cheap nature and as the kind of cultural logic of historical capitalism. And it did so through a very peculiar cosmology that was about far more than ideas. It was a cosmology of nature and society. And I don't mean the, that purely as intellectual notions. I mean that nature and society of the civilized and the savage emerged as what scholars call real abstractions. That is, abstractions treated as real by the powerful to remake the world in a way conducive to the endless accumulation of capital. So in this, our everyday words of nature and society are no longer innocent that they drip with blood and dirt, as Marx might say, every bit as much as enclosure and colonial conquest. In the English language, both nature and society assume their modern familiar meanings in the century after 1550. Society becomes common in the English language only after several key developments. One is the defeat of Ket's Rebellion in England in 1549, the high tide of resistance to agrarian capitalism. Another is the onset of the English coal revolution in 1530, not 1780. 1530 is when coal starts uh, um, uh, to really launch. And the expulsion of the agricultural population as part of these processes um, as a result. But not just that. The intensification of English colonial rule in Ireland from 15. 41, in which the whole discourse of conquest and colonization was on civility and savagery. Indeed, the Earl of Northampton tells Henry VIII uh, that the trick is to draw all the wild Irish, his words, into English-style towns. And this was a strategy that would be repeated again and again. It was uh, uh, precisely what the Castilians do in colonial Peru after 1571. It was what the Dutch would do in Southeast Asia after 1620. So, and just as the Castilians called indigenous Peruvians naturales, the English viewed the Irish as savages. So that means, we're going to get to that in just a moment, that means that all of a sudden there becomes an important revaluation of whose work matters. So by 1700, as Silvia Federici reminds us, the definition of women as non-workers was nearly completed. So nature society and man-woman as very powerful binaries, as real abstractions, was established in this period, was absolutely decisive. It was not just about slavery. It was not just about conquest. It was not just about rationality. But it was about the emergence of cultural formations and formations of power uh, over everyday life premised on binaries. So just as most work no longer counted as work, that is, women's work, slaves' work, etc., but was necessary to the system of production and exchange, so too most humans no longer counted as humans. All right, so by 1750, this system, which had been tremendously dynamic, shows signs of wear. And this is where we're going to end. We're going to end on the eve of the Industrial Revolution. And if you recall, the last periodization here is not 1784, when the rotary steam engine is, is developed, but 1793, when, does somebody want to guess what, what machine comes in in 1793? Yes, thank you, yes. And if we say the cotton gin is at the center of this reinvention of capitalism, all of a sudden, where does our attention go? It goes to race, goes to genocide, goes to expulsion, 
It goes to the industrialization of the countryside. Remember Marx's remark on the urbanization of the countryside, by which he means the extension of capitalist relations. So it is striking, indeed, and, and uh, contemporaries in England in the early 19th century said this all the time. It was only the fall in the price of cotton that made the steam engine profitable in basic industry. And that's an important linkage to make because it tells us that metropole and colony and race and, uh, the, and genocide and the expulsion of indigenous peoples were all of a piece. So this is a significant turning point in the history of capitalism. This was also an era of 1750 to 1815, a period of profound agricultural crisis and agrarian crisis across the Atlantic world. This is, of course, famously the era of the Haitian French and American revolutions, but also profound agrarian crisis in England and uh, 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 the era of a significant anti-colonial revolt, Tupac, uh, Tupac Amaru in Peru in the 1780s, uh, uh, Pugachev in Russia in the 1770s. But we're not going to end there. And by the way, this is just another chart you can look at as I, uh, uh, this shows the extraordinary um, constitutive role of slavery and cotton exports in the making of the Industrial Revolution, but it doesn't stop there. Uh, the sugar plantations of the West Indies, the, the uh, uh, sort of formations that appeared as a result of the 17th century climate crisis, uh, uh, climate forcing of European power and production, out of the West Indian plantations uh, flowed capital that would go directly into the formation, the capital formation of Manchester textile mills in the 1780s and 90s, perhaps as much of a th as a third of capital formation in British industry in the late 18th century came from the cotton plantations. That is the actual, that's why we need to pay attention to political economy. And, and that was money, that, that was capital. There was the result of turning islands like Barbados into a biological wasteland and uh, into a burial ground for about three or 400,000 African slaves. So that's, that's crucial here, but it doesn't end here when we want to think of the Industrial Revolution. The fundamental condition for the Industrial Revolution was the proletarianization of women and the imposition of a radically new form of the second shift and, and so on and so forth. That it's not just the wage gap, which is the, the, the figure on the right, but lo and behold, despite recent uh, um, uh, pronouncements about fossil capital, it turns out that women were the majority of the English working class in 1830. Who would have thought? And oh, by the way, the, the immediate precondition was the, uh, uh, not just the care work, but the biological work of women in birthing the modern proletariat, which precedes rather than follows the Industrial Revolution. So this gives us a whole set of different ways of thinking about the interrelations between human numbers, human work, the work of nature, uh, uh, and uh, enduring relations of equality and inequality, of justice and injustice, that uh, um, have been presented to us, I think, rather unproblematically in a very old and conventional and Eurocentric Industrial Revolution narrative. So what, where does this leave us? Well, the old path was to say everything begins in 1492 or pick your favorite date and nothing that happens after that matters. That's obviously not true. I think one of the great insights of uh, the French historian Fernand Bradel was that we are dealing with successive layers of historical time, much like, uh, ge much like geologists look at stratigraphy, at the, 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 the stratigraphic signals in the... Uh, uh, in the earth, well, we can look at history in, in terms of a kind of geohistorical stratigraphy uh, in which the Columbian moment, the unification of Pangaea, has not gone away, is still with us. Climate change has not gone away, although it's very different today. Uh, the Dutch-led financial, scientific, and productive revolutions are still with us, but so too are the coal, steam, and slavery revolutions of the 19th century, the petro-capitalist revolutions of the 20th century, the neoliberal revolutions of the present. All are still with us, which is to say that we deny at our peril the longer history of capitalism, and that 1492 is not over. We, we can say that the recuperation of capitalism's early modern origins and its extraordinary reshaping of global natures long before the steam engine is significant in our work, in our politics to develop 
an effective response to runaway global warming, and that the system, in saying system change, is a capitalist world ecology of capital, power, and nature. It's not all about economics. The rise of capitalism, therefore, cannot be reduced to precisely that, economics. Capitalist scene names capitalism as a system of power, profit, and reproduction in the web of life. It thinks capitalism as if human relations form through the geographies of life. Far from refusing the problem of political economy, however, we would highlight capitalism as a history in which islands of commodity production and exchange operate within oceans of cheap or potentially cheap natures. Now, that is not only ending, the frontiers of cheap nature are not only ending, but the, the, the amplification, acceleration of climate change means, amongst other things, an epical inversion of that process. No longer is the web of life a place where costs can be reduced, but the web of life is now entering into, in a very powerful way, the cost of production all across the different sectors of the world economy, something that I take up in capitalism and the web of life. And that these are these moments of rising costs of production are indeed squeezes to capital accumulation, but are also powerful dimensions of capitalism's racialized, gendered, and colonial domination, operationalized through these binary codes of society and nature. Thank you. That's a, that's a wonderful question, and there's a, a version of this talk that I often give, I'm sorry, has a, a lot of attention to both Malthus and to Neo-Malthusian thinking, which of course is, is still very much with us. Indeed, Anthropocene thinking is very much Neo-Malthusian in terms of seeing the problems of uh, uh, nature as somehow really separate from the problems of the inside. So Malthus is interesting for all sorts of reasons. Uh, I think it's important to understand Malthus's thought as um, a, a fear of two great moments of social revolt. Let's remember Malthus was very much an intellectual of the English ruling class, and not just of the English ruling class at home, but he was the first chair of political economy from 1805 at the East India Company College. Uh, so he was uh, absolutely an imperial intellectual as well. So what was going on? Well, in, in, the half, in the quarter century, rather, before the first essay is published in 1798, we, we had seen the most rebellious quarter century of um, uh, the capitalism had yet seen. We saw not just these anti-colonial revolts in Russia uh, and Peru and elsewhere, not just the Haitian, French, and American revolutions, but also this is the era when uh, 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 we get the word strike, that the, the sailors uh, 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 shut down the port of London in 1768, striking their sails. And from there, it got even worse for the, for the English ruling class, because in 1775, um, in Liverpool, the sailors uh, uh, were fired upon by local authorities. They took their, the sailors took their ship's guns out of the ships and directed them at the mercantile exchange and bombarded the mercantile exchange. Um, across the English countryside, there were uh, uh, insurrections, basically food riots. This was also an era, this crisis, this agrarian crisis of uh, the late, uh, of the second half of the 18th century was a moment um, at which the English agricultural revolution had run out of gas. Indeed, we have uh, uh, either close to zero or close to negative uh, 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 agri um, yield growth in English agriculture over this period. Per capita food uh, consumption in England actually declines in this period. We have widening class inequality in this period, and also we have rising uh, uh, we have rising population because of a fertility revolution, which owed much to the success of enclosures during the first English agricultural revolution, roughly 1600 to 1750. So we had a moment that looked 
somewhat like Maltus's abstract picture of static agricultural growth and rapid human growth in human numbers. Maltus wasn't stupid. He was just afraid and he couldn't think historically, so he thought, this is it. Um, and the, it's striking that we see the reemergence of Malthusian thought before the commodity price crises of the early 1970s. We see it with the, the Sierra Club's sponsorship of Paul Ehrlich's population bond, uh, which I encourage you all to go back and uh, go and look at the first, uh, at the opening pages of this book, where Ehrlich, uh, very much in the spirit of Maltus, um, recounts uh, uh, his Ehrlich's uh, uh, voyage to Delhi in, uh, with his family in the 1960s, and he describes it as dirty and filthy and overcrowding. At a time when Delhi had two million people, Paris at the same time had eight million. So uh, there's this there's this moment of uh, uh, of a biologist responding to uh, his perceptions of the world, which have very little to do with the actual history um, of even of demography. Um, so Ehrlich says, you know, everyone, you know, hundreds of millions of people are going to die in the next decade from starvation and all this stuff, which was uh, not, at, not at all true, as we know, but also precedes the, um, even the commodity uh, price uh, 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 boom of oil and food in 70, 73 to 75. So it's worth pausing, why was the Neo-Malthusian agenda embraced so strongly? Uh, in 1968, the New York Times uh, editorial board in that year warned of a ter quote of a terrible Malthusian nightmare in our future. That was the word uh, words of the ever ever insightful and wise uh, editors of the New York Times. Well, what was going on in 1968? Well, it was a worldwide revolt. It was a student worker revolt. It was African American freedom struggle. It was anti colonial revolts across the world. It was the same reality that Malthus was responding to. And so I think that it's very important to locate Malthusianism in terms of a fear of a global, multiracial, uh, feminized working class and uh, of, social un of the kinds of social unrest that tends to follow from that. And that has very little to do with human numbers as such. Now, human numbers are important. We need to pay attention to human numbers. Uh, but we don't really have the same kind of great historical sociology, historical demography of human numbers that one would wish. And I think that that's also one of the legacies of Malthus and New Malthusianism, is to uh, uh, undermine a critical sensibility, a critical historical demography. So, Jason, I'd like to ask you about the metaphor that you use you know, the oceans, no, the islands of modification and oceans of appropriation. And I wanted to ask you, but of course, you know, you as an historian are very aware and show us how those, the size of those islands and oceans don't stay the same, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. over time. And I wanted to go back to that one moment in your talk when you, you kind of said, you know, the, the, the way that Marxists have sometimes viewed the problem that's in common with neoclassical economics mm -hmm. uh, is to see this, this getting bigger all the time. But, of course, the oceans of appropriation have gotten smaller, right? So I'm just wondering how you, you kind of understand the relationship between a certain, I think, undeniable tendency, right, to lessen the oceans of appropriation, right, with the resistance to seeing the course of history being a kind of course, a march of commodification that some Marxists would see. Yeah, I mean, it's so hard because the history of the modern world is, I mean, we need to have... It is a march of commodification, and it's not just a march of commodification. And the, the, that, that, uh, the, the movements of the great commodity frontiers, you can think of sugar, especially in the early modern period, you can think of oil over the 19th and 20th centuries. The march of the, those commodity frontiers is, is not even primarily about, it's hard to, this is why it's hard to do world history, and you see me stumbling over this. We need to have, as I think Donna Haraway would remind us, we need to have situated world historical stories. So we need to understand that at every turn, the march of these commodity frontiers is dependent on 
cultural and territorial power to secure all sorts of cheap nature all around these commodities. So the sugar frontier only works because there was cheap land, there was cheap labor, there were cheap raw materials, and that every step those relations had to be not merely economically enabled, but culturally and politically and militarily enforced. And I think that that's, that's where we get caught up a lot of times. So the problem, the challenge, I'm, not, I'm, I'm really struggling to see if I can say something sensible um, in response to your wonderful question, uh, Erica, is so we have to, we have to understand that, that those great commodity frontiers and we can see this in the history of mining and metallurgy, too, that the most precocious forms of industry often develop around them, but they're not. But then we can't just fall into that old industry, extractive, nature, labor mindset. We have to be able to understand that those are situated within a particular moment of the development of capitalism. So we, we have to be able to move from part to whole. That's part of, I think, what I'm struggling with in, in engaging your question. We have to be able to move from part from, from part to whole, but we also have to be able to look at the history of capitalism as a whole, which is shaped by its parts but not reducible to them. And to recognize, I think, with humility, sometimes people have a visceral reaction. Well, we can't say, you know, have these totalizing stories of capitalism. That's not what you're saying at all. But that we can't have that. But we do need that. We do. We just need to have them properly uh, situated and to understand that the, the dynamics of the system as a whole are at once shaped and shaping regional dynamics. So when people want to come and offer of our critique from the standpoint of the region, we have to understand that there is always this part whole problem. And I think that this comes up a lot in Anthropocene Capitalocene dialogues because uh, there is that, um, there's this tendency because of how we're, we're trained to, to, to immediately go into the general and the particular, which of course is very modern binary. So how do we tell stories in which uh, the bodily and the cultural and the economic and the political and the global and the local are all uh, wrapped up with each other. I think um, that's difficult because of our training, that we have to do a lot of unthinking and then rethinking and to have a spirit of generosity in our conversations, which is not always present there. Um, um, so, uh, especially in recent versions of ecological Marxism, I would say. So, we can start. We, we can get into that a little bit if you want. Uh, uh, if I understood correctly, you said that uh, by the 18th Uh, yeah, it's right here. Factories in, in 1533. Uh, uh, this is from a British parliamentary report. I'm sorry, I don't have my other glasses with me. So we have uh, females as percent of the workforce um, in cotton, 52%, uh, ages 12 and under, 65. Um, anyway, uh, uh, we can get into this more, but... Uh, um, one of the one of the of course the the figures that we've received uh, in terms of how we think about history is the wage worker as a white and male, and uh, the history of capitalism is not based on white male workers, wage workers. Well, in that case, the, the name of the of the association that Marx formed, the International Working Men Association, yeah. is, is further outrageous. Yes, yes, uh, I I would agree with that, and. No, I'm not one of these guys who says Marx was right about everything. Uh, but when he uses the word, uh, uh, in German, the word mensch doesn't have the same gendered meaning. And it's often translated as men. But this is a different thing. I don't know who came up with it. Did he? Did Marx? I should know this. Did, did Marx come up with the International Working Men's Association as a name? That's, come on, don't we have a Marx geek in here? Come on. Uh, all right. We'll have to figure that out later. All right. Yeah.
happening with the Sabafets around this time and the Ottomans and the Mughals. And because these are also giant empires and giant, like, many massive things are happening. And perhaps we come with the same data. There are certain things I'm trying to think through the book, my little Mughal history and map it onto your temporality. But what would, would the story be or even the Chain Empire? Yeah, it's a great question. So, um, so we see in, in the breakup of the Roman Empire, in the East, the impact of climate change was still significant, um, especially with the, the after, after about the year 200, the uh, monsoon cycle seems to shift sufficiently that it does not bring the Nile floods as frequently as it once did, which undermines uh, uh, that was, of course, the granary of Rome and then the granary of uh, Constantinople, now Istanbul. But, it, it, but in general, the, the um, sort of Byzantine-Ottoman zone weathers these changes better, the, cha the shifts, because a lot of these... Um, I mean, I'm, I'm just putting all of this together. This is, this is for me, one of the fundamental missing pieces of, of what we need to put climate change in the history of the rise of capitalism. So I'm really just putting this all together. It's clear that the Eastern Roman Empire survives and does okay for, for a very long period of time. It's ultimately stopped right here, um, which is the 536 event uh, in volcanic activity, the, the solar minima and the Justinian plague all at once. So talk about... The Justinian plague, after the, the Byzantine emperor uh, uh, Justinian, uh, wipes out about a third of the Byzantine uh, population. So they get completely whacked, but then uh, um, there were, that, that's much earlier than what you're talking about. Um, it's a really good question. I would need to look more, more seriously, and I think a lot of us need to look more seriously at how the, the Enzo uh, pattern in the Pacific, the North Atlantic Oscillation, uh, 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 as key moments of the climate system are shaping what's going on in Central Asia, which of course would answer the Mughal question. And of course Central Asia remains a, hot, a vibrant hothouse. You mentioned the Ottomans too, of course. A vibrant hothouse of, of Eurasian change throughout, throughout this period. Um, so there's obviously, there's obviously a significant relationship there. Uh, um, and that's we need to have a similar mapping for those movements. Let me let me say. So there's just I think I think now what we've done. What somebody like John Brooke has done in his wonderful book, even if it's a bit vanilla, but it's an absolutely wonderful book, is just sort of mapping it all. And then if we put it with somebody like Victor Lieberman, right? So Lieberman maps these climate shifts with what he calls whatever state complexity or the rise and fall of these states from from Southeast Asia all the way to uh, to France. Is we have to then begin to move to, I think, a more sophisticated and, and some kind of Marxist understanding through which, in a, not in an economic determinist sense, because I think Marxism that does that isn't really all that worthwhile, but in a relational sense in which we bring climate in in a more fundamental way, but also get out of that kind of Eurocentric bind. Mine is Europe-centered, but I'm not saying it's, I, I don't think Europe, I think Europe is a backward uh, zone until very late. So yes, we have to put in the Central Asian moment of that. Um, it's such a great question. I want to be able to say so much more because I'm so curious about it all. Uh, yeah, we have time for a couple more questions. Actually, I was uh, just going to um, ask. I know this while this graph was up, but I don't know. It feels like a few events are actually sort of missing from here. Yes. And I'm not entirely sure how to be able to explain that. And the one that came to mind to me almost immediately was the Mongol conquest. So yeah. Yeah. 12th and 13th century, yeah. that was really during the period between the 8th and Wolf uh, downturns. I'm sorry, I'm trying to read that. Uh, that's, that's right. So the, the Mongols are rolling into town right around the year, uh, right around here. Yes, but the Mongols are pretty stable uh, 100 years on that side of town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, uh, that's a great question. Uh, uh, but as we know, the Mongols did not make their way to Paris, so uh, we're not, uh, and surely if they had, would have precipitated the end of feudalism, and we would probably have a very different world in which capitalism took, 
if it ever took shape, took place someplace else, probably southern China. Um, but uh, 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 that's, a, that's a great question. The Central Asia has to be put into these stories. Um, yes, absolutely. So let me just affirm that's a great insight. Yeah. I'm going to take uh, this opportunity to, to ask one the last question. <coughs> Absolutely. Um, this question is kind of inspired by uh, a ridiculous uh, article making the rounds on the internet recently around uh, having to do with octopus uh, and uh, a crackpot theory around octopus eggs being, uh, you know, coming from outer space uh, millions of years ago. And okay. Uh, precipitating the rise of what are uh, the authors claim are actually alien species. Okay. Um, bear with me for a second. Right. No, no, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, so, and then we're looking at this, this graph that was up around oh, yeah. um, yes. solar intensity. Yeah. Um, and, and you're talking about these solar flares and these climate events, which, again, much like these hypothesized mm -hmm. octopus eggs, Salient from outer space, mm -hmm. crackpot theory. Uh, but you know, in this case, is again uh, a sort of extraplanetary force that is mm -hmm. bombarding the planet and causing uh, historical change. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, how do you square this sort of this expansive understanding of nature that actually encompasses extraplanetary forces mm -hmm. with this reach towards a world history that, that, that articulates itself as a whole when actually there are things coming from beyond the whole of the globe. Oh, that's right, yeah. And how do we, how do, do we need to expand our, our notion of nature even beyond the already expansive uh, proposition that you, you're putting forward? Yeah, so the web of life includes things like or the Earth's orbital variations, and the Milankovitch cycles, the 26,000-year cycles that the Mayans zeroed in on, uh, uh, amongst other great insights. Um, yes, in fact, uh, uh, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. I mentioned these in the introduction to Web of Life, and then, then it gets left out and people forget about it because they get caught up in, in some of the details, you know, like 500 years of world history or something. But, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, we have... We, we, we have to take this very seriously, right? And uh, that, uh, uh, I mean, I think somebody like David Christian uh, has, serves a, a useful purpose here in his version of big history. I think there's some real problems with that. Um, but I think that we have to cease to be, in an era of climate crisis, I think that we have to cease our normal scholarly convention of trying to identify our turf and draw lines around it. I think that we, we have to say, Okay, this is a problem, and we always have to be going outside of that. And I think today that includes not just going outside the region or the country, looking at the globe as a whole, but we do have to understand that, you know, how do we fit in, you know, what's the Marxist theory of volcanic events? Um, like, that's a weird question to ask. But it turns out that volcanism is like a big deal in the history of planet Earth. I mean, and the human species, uh, not least at one point, I think, what, about 20,000 years ago, the you know, human species was reduced to, what, about 1,000 breeding pairs? Some, some, I think that's now the, the conclusion. So we have, we, we have to have a way, a, a cosmology and an intellectual state shift that would support a, po a political state shift to deal with climate crisis, and, and that's going to have to deal with things like solar minima. And this is coming up around geoengineering, because what is the geoengineering procedure? Well, we're going to isolate, we're going to try to reproduce basically a volcanic eruption uh, by putting sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, no, really, I mean, that's Crutzen's argument. Um, and uh, it's sort of like a James Bond villain plan for saving the Earth or something. Uh, we're going to put mirrors into space and reflect. Now, it's not that geoengineering is uh, always, in every case, uh, uh, um, unjustifiable. I uh, should get somebody like Daniel to comment on some of this. But a lot of times it's nuts because it's done in a very narrow, fragmenting kind of part before the whole kind of way of looking at um, 
at life and the system of life that we're in, which of course involves, you know, floating around on this big blue ball, you know, around the sun with all this, you know, comets and asteroids and everything else going around. I don't know. Are, are they octopi really from outer space? Okay. But, octo, but it's, octopuses are cool. Like they have the neural, the, the neural cells all around. And there's a whole bunch of weird stuff about octopuses, right, that we don't understand. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.